So how's it going, my comic chat armor? We're here today with Zachary Mavroyce, the creator of Voyage. How you doing, Zach? Doing all good, man. Just came home from work. Busy day, but you know what? I'm just glad to be home, honestly. It was <laughs> today was a long day. Oh yeah, there's no greater feeling than getting off work and that first couple steps in the door is so just amazing. Oh yeah. So what have you been doing since the last time we talked a year ago? Oh man. And it, yeah, it's funny. It, it really is crazy. It's been that long since we talked. Um, but since then, um, when you gave me a podcast show last year, which was like, should be February or March, uh, that was on the campaign voyage melting pot. It was supposed to be a anthology, um, sequel to the first voyage book, um, which was an anthology as well. That one didn't go uh, according to plan. It failed. So I took a step back and I said, well, I'm going to make my first issue of my ongoing run um, for Voyage. You know, just skip the anthology stuff, just focus on the character. And um, I launched that campaign, Voyage Issue 1, actually last month. And unfortunately, that failed as well. So I'm re-strategizing. So I can launch it on Indiegogo because both those campaigns were launched on Kickstarter and I'm going to be launching on October 1st. So all this time up, it's just pre-launch. So anybody who wants to sign up for Voyage Issue 1 right now, they can on Indiegogo. And it, uh, you will get an exclusive trading card if you sign up. So, Okay. Is the book finished? Is it ready to go? For the most part, like I'm gonna say, yeah, like I got fifty. Uh, what is it? Fifteen pages left to pencil, basically. But you know, October. This is June. Yeah. So, yeah, like uh, I just got to wrap up fifteen pages. My inker is inking them a week, you know, along the way. My colors, they're all we're all fast, and we're super professional with the work quality that we put in. So by the time that October comes. The artwork is just in the editing stages, basically. Like, it's going to get the colors are being wrapped up, and then it's going to be sent to the letter who's like quick, and I edit it. So, and I also have an editor on the book. So, we're all close friends. We all know each other, and uh, we don't skimp out on the quality that we give. So, people will get their bang. Um, are they all local? Do you just hand them off, or do you mail them? We're not local. Um, we don't. Mail. I used to mail them before I went to the Cuber school. I was mailing them physically until I could find out. You're like, oh, you know, you could scan them in and just email out your pages. So, you know, I usually just finish them up, scan them, and the rest is, you know, pretty much self-explanatory. <laughs> they get the email. I forget that we we can scan stuff now. For all of us to access the same stuff, because we're going to have to, like, consistently process, you know, step by step. We have to, like, catch up with each other's pace. So, uh, personally for me, I have a uh, Google Drive. And, you know, we all just, like, access in on the same folder. And we just, like, you know, upload into the folders correct uh, that correspond to the stages. Sweet. Um, do you want to give them the elevator pitch of what the book's about? If they didn't see the first interview? Okay, so everyone who's listening in, Sondaron is an interdimensional space explorer uh, that was casted out from his star system. So he embarks on this hero's journey, going after this artifact called the Spear and Knob. The issue is this artifact is shattered into many fragments, so they're scattered throughout the universe. And the lore behind it is that if all the fragments are found and put together, it unites the universe once more because it's broken. And Sonderon doesn't know much, if anything, about this quest that he's supposed to do. So he's like that 18-year-old kid that acts like he knows everything and he gets kicked out of his house and then he's into the real world. And then you're like, oh, shit, like, I don't know what any of this is. So he was so used to everything from his own system that everything outside of that is all new. So it's an overwhelming um, amount of pressure. There you go. Now, what, what was you saying? <laughs> so Voyage is, the book is basically about this interdimensional space explorer named Sandron. 
and he's casted out of his star system. So he has to embark on a hero's journey, finding this artifact called the Spear Knot. And the issue is this artifact is shattered into tiny pieces and scattered throughout the universe. And no one knows where it is because this religion is such an old, dead religion. And it's long, uh, long thought forgotten that very few people like uh, know about it, like cult, uh, uh, cultists, um, conquerors. Um, you know, Illuminati type of secret groups. And then you got this young spry chicken, Sonderhan, right? And so he's like that 18 year old kid who just got kicked out of his household, you know, and he's now in the real world and he's got to figure everything out, you know, because, you know, in his own star system, that was like his household. And outside of it, there was no interference between the two. So he's got to learn everything all over again. And that's what makes it really interesting. And the cool thing about it is, you know, it's like Indiana Jones in space, but it's a genuine alien comic book. It's genuine sci-fi. Like, you know, you have like humans uh, in sci-fi movies and comic books and whatnot. And that's all great. And I'm not knocking that because there's great stories within that. But I always was like, oh, man, I would like to read – uh, have you know sci-fi book that has an alien as a main character, so that's what my books are really just evolve around. Okay. Um, who who do you have working on this anthology with you? It's not an anthology. This is actually the uh, issue of his ongoing series. I left the anthology parts behind. I don't do those anymore at the moment. Um, only because it's just a lot of work. I gotta like keep track of so many people. <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, you delve into contracts, you know, payments get dispersed like left and right. And I'm at a point in my age where I can't, I just can't do that anymore. Like I got to do my own thing. So Sonder on and Voyage, that's mine. And I'm just continuing or starting his official story and his ongoing run. So uh, the first issue is 48 pages. So 32 pages is the main story. And then eight pages to nine is the backup story as a bonus. That's a pretty good size book for your first one. Well, I feel like for a first issue, like um, if no one knows who you are or if they do, and they're trying to get a good impression out of you, you got to hit them hard on the first issue. Now, like when I do issues two, three and up, they're going to be docked down to 20 pages, 2022, you know, the standard size. But the first issue for me, I feel like, Welcome to the world of this character, and that's why I wanted to really – um sorry, I'm like scrambling because the first part of the story, it's the reason why it's 32 pages is because I'm taking my time showing people who this character is, you know, really taking in the moments and getting a good solid impression of this extraterrestrial so people can like him and – that's important. Is you're doing full color, right? Yes, full color. Okay. Um so are you going to any Comic Cons this year? Or have you been to any? I haven't uh this year. In fact, um next weekend I'm gonna be going to a comic convention in Morristown, uh Garden State Comic Fest. Okay. That's so a... I'm gonna Go ahead. No, no, I apologize. What were you saying? Are you going as a fan or are you going as a vendor? Uh, I can't. I can't even afford it as a vendor. Um, I've been financially stuck for the past couple months, including this one. So I'm going to network. Okay. I'm going to hit uh, – I mean I'm obviously going to have fun and party you know, because my me, I'm meeting up with all my like fellow creators and stuff. So I'm going to you know catch up with like Billy Tucci, um, you know, Chuck Dixon, Graham Nolan. Um, you know, uh, like uh, the smaller guys, you know, like my team, like Nick Pony, Von Coleman, Bobby Christophus, like these guys are like I'm having a good time with. So um, I'm mostly for the uh, the convention part networking after parties is like we're all catching up. Sweet. Um, let's see. Oh, that's right. Where did you get inspiration for this book? The inspiration, I wouldn't say for the book, um, the inspiration for the character was like, 
when I was a little kid, uh, it was like middle school, right? And I was just creating characters. Uh, I, they had no direction, and I create. I was just creating alien species, and like all these different aliens on this one so like this solar system, right? But they never had that one individual to like represent them. And it wasn't until the year I went to the Cuba school, the year before, I had a dream because I was like, how do I make this into a comic book? Like, you know, talk about these aliens and stuff or really delve into it. And I went, I went to bed and I just dreamt of this character, um, Sonderon, where he was like the protector of the solar system, like the cheesy stuff, right? But when I woke up, I was like writing those down and whatnot. I didn't think it would work. And it just like I started putting, you know, practicing with it, uh, with the idea of just rewriting it, uh, uh, drawing a couple examples. And I was like, oh, this is pretty good. And then that's, you know, right around that point, I went into the Joe Cuba school. So I really started fleshing that stuff out. And I was like, wow, this can actually work. Like, you know, I got something good going on here. So the inspiration really just came from that dream. So is it one protector per universe? So that's like the cheesy part was like, oh, he's the protector that represents his star system. But that was like, I just took what that dream was, wrote it down. You're like, all right, how can I creatively uh, manipulate this and make it work uh, so it's not uh, unrealistic in a comic book? Um, Even though comics are all unrealistic, but also realistic. I just wanted it to like really work. And um, Sonderon, he's part of that. He's from that uh, solar system. He's a Kemetan. That's the species. Mm-hmm. So in a way, when he's doing what he's doing, he is a representative of his own kind because he's the very first of his kind to ever step out of that star system, um, even though he's exiled. So to some extent, that is true. But I'm just – there's so much lore behind it that – you know, it's not what that dream initially had it, what it was all about. So the inspiration did come from that dream. So do you, just a weird question. Do you think the world is ready for aliens? Like if they came down tomorrow, do you think it would be? Oh, fuck no. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, fuck. As much, dude, I love aliens. I like, uh, I listen to, uh, a lot of documentaries like Bob Lazar. Um, uh, he's like a, a very huge figure in the uh, UFO realm of the uh, <laughs> you know extraterrestrial atmosphere, mm-hmm. and I like all that stuff. But I'm gonna be honest, dude. <sighs> the way the world is right now, it's in such a fragile, shaky state. It's it's not gonna happen, bro. We're gonna freak the fuck out. Like, and personally for me, I think it's a conspiracy, but like, I think that the government is going to use aliens. Like when, like if the rapture ever came, right. And people started, you know, getting snatched out, you know, from the world, like from earth, I feel like the government's going to be like, Oh, you know, aliens are the ones that did that. And, you know, it's kind of like covering up from what actually is to hide us from the real truth. It's like third eye type, dude, I could get into like this, you know, like, I love, dude, I love this shit, but I'm not going to get huge into it, but it's a lot of cool stuff. Like, I like looking into a lot of different things, like the scientific development uh, nuclear center called CERN. Uh, I think it's in Germany. It was where Albert Einstein um, was working at in that area. And that uh, reactor, that um, engine, I forget what the actual name is. You see it in movies all the time, like the arc reactor in the MCU. Yeah. You know, I like, you know, conspiracies say that they're uh, using that to connect, uh, contact aliens or the reptilians, or that's actually uh, biblical um, scripture says that that's the aerial location that Lucifer fell, and that's what they're trying to con. Dude, it's cool shit. So, okay. Um, I like to take bits and pieces of that and see how far I can go to really have fun with like those cool ideas and implement that in space that has nothing to do with earth. Are there aliens in the area 51? Nah, <laughs> no. Uh, um, I think at one point, yes, but they shifted. And once the 
media even started like sniffing in that direction, I hundred percent they uh believe that they shifted that everything over to a different location. So now Area Fifty One is like that poster child of you know, oh aliens are still there. Like I remember that uh fucking few years ago, the Area Fifty One raid. Yeah. Where everybody was freaking out about that, celebrities and stuff, and I'm like, I, I wanted to do it if I had the money. I hands down would have fucking done it, but realistically speaking, there's nothing there, you know. And what actually happened is there's only a couple hundred people that were showing up compared to the hundreds of thousands that said they were going to do. So that was so unrealistic, no. Nah. <laughs> but it's fun. I I like that kind of stuff. Dead or alive, who would you like to make a comic book with? Dead or alive. Um, with what I'm doing now, like uh, with the stuff that I like to tell stories um, in the genre, if I had to pick an individual, dude, Wally Wood. Fucking A, dude. That man is on another level. Like, Wally Wood is, like, everyone, like, loves Jack Kirby. And, like, I'm, you know, credit, credible credits, dude. These guys are all legends. You know, you got Jack Kirby, um, Virgil Finley, uh, what is it? Um, Sal Buscema, John Buscema, uh, like, all these guys, you know, down the line. But, like, Wally Wood, dude, was a master at sci fi. Like, his storytelling in sci fi was just top tier shit. Him and Richard Corbin. So would you create something new or expand on a project they already have? No, I would create something new. Um, I get that some people do that. Like they like to expand on stuff like um, like uh, Winnie the Pooh because it's now public domain. People will go and gravitate towards it because now they get the chance to do it. And then they do like the horror Winnie the Pooh. Um, you got like all that weird shit. Yeah. Um, I, I like creating my own stuff. I like there is money in it. Don't get me wrong, there is. Uh, it doesn't feel genuine to me. It re- like for me, it really doesn't. Like unless it's a specific project I'm working on where I know that it's gonna be like that. Like I wouldn't have anything in Voyage just be like built off of something like like you know Wally Woods work and just move forward, continue it. I wouldn't do that. No. Yeah, it's like riding on there kind of riding their wave a little bit the pro you know the problem with the problem with the comic book industry is there's so much infighting with one another like all of us that it 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 takes us um our attention away from what actually what they're winning you know the what they're doing uh, what they're doing i'm sorry like let's be real here the reason why you see variations like a black Spider-Man, um, a gay Superman, and all these different characters. The reason being, it's not like one, yeah, they're following that that trending wave, but that's just – that's not the core reason why they're doing it. The reason why is you have the high-end executives, right, the big top guns. And I'm not talking about Jim Lee or Joe Quesada. They're not the top guns, right? You, I'm talking about the Disney high-end top, top people, right? They're trying to find every single way to get you to not uh, do any type of independent versions of a character once it hits public domain. They're not going to want you to do that. That's why they do all these variations. So when you have these art teams in comic books, they do these getaways when they say, hey, we want a woman Thor. Like, do that. Like, you know, figure it out. And they have those art getaways for the weekend and shit where the editors and whatever. Basically, they tell all that stuff and they trickle that information down to your Jim Lee, your Joe Quesada. And they're going to go ahead because they're part of editorial, the top guns in the comic book industry for those companies. They're going to say, let's go out for the uh, getaway weekend and figure the stuff out. So that's when the art team below will Go ahead and figure that, you know, that female Thor with Jane Foster and whatnot. And what what they actually did is that when Thor hits public domain, you can't do a female Thor. 
You can't do a gay Thor. You can't do that's they do it with Wolverine. They do it with Spider Man. Like what? Like that Spider Verse. It's it's not accidental. This is all intentional shit. So the minute it hits, like the minute that Spider Man hits public domain, thirty years after public domain, you cannot touch it. Any type of variation, you cannot do that because they own the i like they own those air variations, those intellectual property rights. Can't do it with Batman. They let Winnie the Pooh slip through their fingers, which is why, you know, that they, they really are kicking themselves in the ass. Like they weren't paying attention to it. It happened. And now people like the regular everyday people can do it. But that's the real reason why all these things in comic books are the way they are. And the reason why it sparks up uh, a lot of conflict between creators, uh, political views and whatnot. It, it's, it takes our attention away from what's actually happening. So we should just not focus on those variations or whatever. Just create your own thing because and do it yourself. Don't bring them to these companies. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot. If you want to work for Marvel or DC, great. I'm not knocking that at all. Hell, I would like to do a Spider-Man comic or Punisher or whatever. The thing is I don't want to have something I created and bring it to them. Mm-mm. Okay. Is there anything you want to say before we go? Um, man, I was like, <laughs> I thought, dude, I feel like I just dropped like a decent amount of like mind blowing information in the last four minutes. But yeah. everyone who's listening, um, I hope you guys like sign up for Voyage Issue One. It's going to launch on Indiegogo October first. Uh, you do get a exclusive trading card when you do sign up. And if you guys are interested in knowing all these different cool things about the industry and, you know, you know, ways to go ahead and figure things out in your, just shoot me a DM or on Instagram and Twitter. It's Zachary's art. Like, dude, I love talking to people. I love dispersing information and I'm, I'm super chill, dude. I, I, I pop up on podcast shows all the time. So I, I'd love to have a conversation with everyone. All right, man. I appreciate you taking the time to come talk with me. You're welcome, man, and thank you for having me on. What? You mean you haven't subscribed to Comic Chat Authority? Oh, come on. Subscribe already. What are you waiting for? It's no big deal. Like, man, don't forget to tell him to hit that like button. Yeah, yeah, that too. Just subscribe.